Welcome back to Reimagine 2020. I'm Jonah Hockhauser, and I'm glad to be joined by Doug Leonard, CEO of Mainframe. Doug, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Well, let's first, uh, you want to give us a little background uh, to our viewers about, you know, who you are and how you got into blockchain? Yeah, you bet. So I got into blockchain in late 2013 when I discovered Bitcoin and some friends were talking about it around Christmas time. And I went, checked out the Wikipedia page and was immediately intrigued. And really what caught my attention was some of the hashing algorithms that I was learning about in some of my security classes at university were overlapping with uh, you know, really being leveraged for a monetary system. And so this caught my attention. And so immediately I uh, started getting involved, started speculating on Bitcoin, uh, lost a lot of money right out of the gate <laughs> and uh, had to have some come to Jesus moments on whether or not I really believed in the tech and would continue to invest my time and resource there or not. And ended up really just starting as a speculator. But as both my uh, talents for development grew, uh, I started to play more with Ethereum, uh, started working on some dApps. And, uh, you know, after graduating, uh, talked a big talk to my wife and said, hey, I think blockchain is going to change the world to the same degree that the internet has. And she said, well, if you believe that, why don't you have a job in blockchain? So stopped doing mobile development, which is what I was uh, pursuing professionally at the time and went and got a job in blockchain. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, as I do before most interviews, I, I, you know, I check out the person online. And so I, I hit your LinkedIn and I must <laughs> say, I loved your LinkedIn description, uh, your description for yourself on LinkedIn. Did, did you write that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, awesome. yeah, I mean, people can go check it out, but really, I feel like LinkedIn is kind of this like uh, place where a lot of posturing happens. And so I, I put in this, you know, very comical uh, description about myself as a little nugget for people who actually do the work to, to read about me. Uh -huh. Well, you know, I, I tip my hat to you. I was, I was very impressed. But uh, something else that I, I got from there was that you, you recently became mainframe CEO. I believe it was January yeah. uh, 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 time. Um, why do mainframe, the first, let's go, uh, let's start off easily. What is mainframe? What do they do? And, and why do they decide to bring you on board uh, as CEO? Sure. So I'll answer the question backwards. Right now, we okay. are a lending protocol for people to borrow against their crypto in hopes of multiplying their investment. So right mm -hmm. now, there are a lot of variable rate type instruments. You've got your compound and Aave. And so we aim to be one of the first uh, at scale solutions for fixed rate, fixed term uh, loans against your cryptocurrency. So mm -hmm. this, this is what mainframe does today, and, uh, but it is not what mainframe has always done. We originally started out as a messaging platform for unstoppable chat. And when we delivered this product to our users, nobody really wanted to use it. <laughs> and so, so we, we took a look around and said, okay, well, what do we have here that's valuable that maybe, you know, the decentralized community would, would like. And so we took our decentralized back, back end and a, like created an uh, environment, we called it mainframe OS for people to be able to deploy their dApps and actually be fully decentralized. Right now, most dApps are just, you know, S3 cloud buckets that uh, are being hosted centrally. And we thought, yeah, this is a really great idea, but we learned yet again that people in this space uh, seem to care about making money, growing their wealth, and the decentralized ethos uh, for for most is kind of secondary to the exciting uh, residual impact of growing your wealth. So uh, we, you know, so so mainframe kind of had these two. You know, predicting the future is very difficult. I was a part of the mainframe team from the beginning. I believed in this vision. I really thought it was going to work, and. Uh, you know, once we released these and put it out there and people, you know, we weren't getting traction, we, we had to come back internally, take a look at, okay, you know, why isn't it working? What are people actually using? Where is utility within blockchain? And uh, so, you know, over, you know, nine, 10 months ago, we actually started repositioning ourselves to be a DeFi product. So it started with mainframe OS with the focus, like all the dApps that we had published were actually DeFi focused dApps. And, and then when I took over as CEO, I took, you know, mainframe OS, 
I put it on a shelf and said, hey, we'll invest in this in proportion to the return that it's going to give us. And, and so it's something that maybe we can come back to in the future. But for right now, all the action is in DeFi. We're really excited to be launching a lending protocol so people can leverage themselves and get exposure uh, to, to different types of opportunities that they otherwise wouldn't have. One thing we saw with Compound is uh, you've got the basic attention token or BAT. And all of a sudden, Compound launches this liquidity mining campaign, and it gave, it gave BAT new value. It gave it additional utility. And, and so uh, something that these lending protocols do is offer tokens that either aren't fully implemented, which is a lot of tokens in this space. It's like, you know, your pre-mainnet, what do you do with that? Well, mm -hmm. if, if there's sufficient liquidity on the market, well, you can take it and make some more short-term plays while maintaining your exposure long-term to projects you believe in. So it's really a way of giving utility to projects that are early in development or uh, aren't as mature as others in the space. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, first off, I, I do also want to tip you, my hat to you guys because, you know, a, a lot of people that, that, a lot of these projects that did get uh, major funding from uh, ICOs like, like you guys did, uh, Either they immediately ran, uh, you know, they served their purpose and then they ran. Uh, but I, I, I must tip my hat to you guys for, you know, delivering on your original promise. And then once you saw it didn't succeed, you, you kept at it and, and you pivoted uh, to continue to try to build uh, in, in this ecosystem. And, 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 I, and that's, I think that's very important because, you know, this technology is so young and, uh, and it does need great developments. Now, um, what you guys are doing now with the mainframe lending protocol is you're offering fixed rate lending uh, and yeah. borrowing. And, and, and we see with DeFi is a lot of variable rate stuff. How are you guys able to guarantee, uh, how are you guys able to set a fixed rate, um, you know, with the mechanisms that currently power DeFi? Yeah, very, very good question. So, so this is a, actually our innovation. So we, we actually have taken uh, an innovation by Dan Robinson. So he created uh, something called the yield protocol. And the yield protocol basically works like this. You, you take up a certain type of collateral or base asset and you lock it up and you mint yourself tokens. This is very similar to the way that MakerDAO works, right? You lock up your Ethereum and you mint this thing called DAI. But rather than locking up or rather than minting DAI, what we do is we mint this uh, fungible token that has a, that is attached to a certain date and a certain base asset and a certain target asset. And so uh, it, essentially, what you do is you sell these tokens at a discount and the delta between the face value of those tokens and what you sell them for locks in the both the earning for the lender and the uh i, I guess the premium that the borrower is going to have to pay to that lender so one quick example if i take a hundred dollars worth of ethereum and then i print 50 y die then i might sell those to you at let's say 97 cents on the dollar if my maturity date is three months out, then uh, so I, I've sold you these, you know, 50 Y die at 97 cents on the dollar. You, you actually end up locking in a 13% effective uh, annual return for yourself. And so mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a, a novel mechanism that is um, a little bit, I, I would say it, it's not refined to have to be able to go out and sell these. And so part of our job is going to be, creating a very uh, intuitive user interface to where it's as easy as just depositing your collateral and then you know, picking you know, what, what amount of discount you're willing to take on your Y tokens. And then, uh, and then essentially, depending on what amount of discount you're willing to take, we'll determine how quickly we can uh, fulfill that loan for you. So mm -hmm. uh, th th that's the, the essential mechanism. And then we, we've added kind of this, novel um, guarantor pool, this like novel piece of innovation that helps guard against some of the challenges we've seen with uh, MakerDAO and their systematic failure on uh, Black Thursday. And then also being a novel way for certain people to stack their, it's like dollar cost averaging and the discount. So, you know, we're, we're seeing the rise of, you know, strategies as a service. You've got the set protocol, and then you've got uh, Wi-Fi or Yiffy uh, mm. as sort of this meta DeFi farming protocol. And, and all these are their strategies, right? They're strategies for how to invest. And so uh, we'll, we'll add to 
uh, this uh, menu of strategies um, with that guarantor role within our protocol. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you know, you, you mentioned that you kind of have to set the, the the date of fulfillment. Let's say when when yeah. you're actually minting that wada, you have to. Um, but the what, wouldn't the changing of value uh, of the underlying asset? So let's say you know I, I sell it for ninety seven cents on the dollar, mm -hmm. but you know as that underlying asset, let's say ETH changes value over the course the life of that loan, wouldn't that uh, affect you know that the 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 end take I'm going to get at the end? You know. If, if I send it, sell, oh, you know, let's say for whatever, for argument's sake, uh, Ether is worth $1 in, yep. in, in this situation. Uh, and, 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 I, and I, mint, I, I, I stake my ETH um, and, I, uh, and I mint Y, um, what do you call it? Y die? Y die. Yeah. yeah y, y, die. y die with it. And then I, and I sell that Y die or I lend out a Y die for, for, for 97 cents on the dollar. But if Ethereum goes up to $2 during that time period, um, and then, and, 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 and the person who cashes back that Y, the Y token, they're getting back two dollars. Doesn't doesn't that change, um, you know, the 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 economics of it? How, how are you getting that fixed rate if the underlying asset is actually changing in value? Yeah. So so I think there's a little bit of a misunderstanding here. So let me see if I can clarify. So the the borrowers are the ones who are locking up their Ethereum, minting Y tokens, and then selling them. And so the your Ethereum goes into a vault, and similar to MakerDAO. Uh, so, so I did this uh, in purchasing my minivan. So I locked up like $20,000 worth of ETH. And uh, I saw over the next three weeks an appreciation of 70% worth of value. We got lucky, right? Mm -hmm. And so my $20,000 worth of ETH suddenly became worth $30,000. But that's sitting in a vault that I own. Now, I only lose ownership of that in the, in the event that ETH crashes in price and I don't uh, keep my collateralization ratio of that vault above the threshold that their protocol requires. So it's, it's the same over here. So mm -hmm. the benefit of your base collateral asset appreciating in value actually goes to the borrower. And so in, in your example that you use where Ethereum is $1 and you, you've locked that up and you've sold it at you know, your Y tokens at 90, 97 cents on the dollar, uh, what, what actually would happen is there is available credit for the borrower to issue additional debt against if they so desire. Otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, it, that, that also acts as a safety buffer so that they can go to sleep at night and not be worried that this thing is going to come crashing down with, you know, crypto does sometimes come crashing down, but there's, uh, you have a lower probability of that occurring. Mm -hmm. But if, if in the system, people still have to worry about if the assets, you know, lowering in value and they're, in the, and they're going to become under collateralized and, and have their that position liquidated, uh, essentially, um, and, and, and lose their, their collateral. Um, so if they have that same downside, why would they want the upside of a fixed rate if, if they could have that, that higher, you know, the, the bigger upside of, of the valuable rate? So, so there, there, there's actually not a difference in the upside is assuming that the, uh, so, so if we're assuming somebody is parking their, uh, you know, $100 of Ethereum in MakerDAO versus $100 of Ethereum in the mainframe lending protocol, the thing you actually have is whenever, and, and this happened to me with my minivan. So I started, uh, you know, my $20,000 locked up in a MakerDAO vault. It, it started at a 1% interest rate. It was like, awesome. You know, this, this is great. This is like, you know, just barely better than what I could get by going to a bank. Let's do it. And, and when those three weeks, the value appreciation happened, where Ethereum grew by 70%, well, guess what? MakerDAO is also a, uh, you, you can repurpose it rather than being used as just a stable coin. You can double down and leverage yourself uh, with exposure to Ethereum. And so that's what everyone was doing, which had the impact of driving the variable interest rate that, governs the MakerDAO system uh, from 1% up to like 17%. And so it, it's like uh, what, what you get with the fixed rate system is you get predictability. Is when you sell that Y token for 97 cents on the dollar, it's set, it's done. And you just show back up, you pay it off whenever, you know, before maturity. And, uh, and, and you, you only lose that uh, three cent delta, you know, per die in this example. But with uh, the variable rate is whenever somebody, you know, you, you see how sushi is moving the markets right now. So somebody launches, you know, a meme coin, no disrespect to sushi. I know a lot of people are very, very deep into that rabbit hole. But uh, the, 
you know, somebody can launch this, you know, farming uh, scheme and they can move markets very, very quickly and unpredictably. And so I, I don't think this is going away very soon. And so something like mainframes fixed rate lending is going to be really valuable for those people who are actually trying to use their assets for more real world type use cases. If, if mm -hmm. you want predictability, if you want uh, to be able to like go and purchase a car or if you have like a real you know, material expense or if you're just somebody who is trying to leverage themselves and doesn't want any surprises, then you're, you're going to choose a tool like mainframe above a tool like MakerDAO compound and Aave, which are all variable rate solutions. So, mm -hmm. so, so to touch on uh, kind of comparing this, like uh, where the greater benefit is with our novel innovation around the guarantor pool. So, so let's take a look at uh, the MakerDAO system. It's, I think what people are most familiar with. When you lock up your Ethereum, you have a collateralization requirement of 150%. And basically that gives them a one third buffer that if your vault becomes under collateralized as the price of Ethereum is dropping, their, their system moves not so quickly with, you know, they've got a price feed and they're, they're using an a, like a, a, a TWAP as the average for, uh, you know, what the actual price is to help make it manip, uh, manipulation proof. And so you, you actually have a price feed that is lagging behind the reality of what's happening outside of that system. And, mm -hmm. and so, uh, so, so that 150, that extra one third of collateral is there so that hopefully they sell, you know, you know the full value of your debt before, before uh, the price crashes and, and their system becomes under collateralized. So with our guarantor, you know, guarantors uh, in, in a traditional sense are people who underwrite risk. And so, mm -hmm guarantors park their money within our protocol and they're essentially agreeing to purchase Ethereum or whatever the collateral asset type is that is uh, being uh, used for uh, as collateral. And they agree to buy it at the strike at a strike price equal to uh, the point at which vaults become liquidated and, and they receive a discount for it because of this mechanism and this prearrangement of a buyer, we, we actually don't need as much of a buffer. And so somebody who's looking to like maximize their leverage of like, you know, if you've got a uh, hundred dollars worth of ETH, uh, you're only going to be able to get around $67 worth of die if you print it all the way up to the, the maximum amount under the MakerDAO system. Under our system, so that's, that's a 150% collateralization requirement. With the guarantor underwriting this risk and who have agreed to actually purchase this collateral, we can ratchet down that, uh, collateralization requirement from 150% somewhere down to 120 to 115%. So, mm -hmm. so the gains in both either safety because it's a, a greater buffer, it's a higher capital efficiency, or in, in terms of increased leverage and exposure that you could have uh, along with the predictability, make it something that's going to be a really interesting tool for farmers and other uh, use cases that probably we haven't even thought about yet. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, 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 I do want to talk about, get into that, the, you know, sushi swapping, uni swapping and other aspects of DeFi. Um, but we can talk about it a little later. I first want to, you know, bring up your use case um, where sure. you're buying a van. You know, when I first heard of DeFi, I mean, we're going, we're going back, you know, three years, two years. If you go to any blockchain or crypto conference two or three years ago, DeFi was not the main stage. DeFi got right. a side stage, it got a small room. And I remember I, I, was, I was there and I, and I remember seeing it and I remember thinking, oh, wow, this is so nice. Decentralized finance, everyone can be a bank. And so when I envisioned what it would look like, it was, I'm a business owner, I need a loan. Instead of going to the banks, which have a limited competition and have set of rules and a lot of managerial fees and stuff, and, and, and me getting let's say, a little screwed by their loan, I could go to this decentralized, you know, financial system and get a better loan for myself. And what we've seen so far, uh, at least, you know, the main use cases for DeFi so far, the mainstream, let's say, as however mainstream it could be, it's so small, but um, for DeFi has not been that, ha has been mm -hmm. more this yield farming where people are, are just you know, trying to churn their own assets to try to create value where there really isn't being value added. And that's why I, I like seeing, you know, hearing your use case where you're saying, 
No, you wanted to buy a minivan. You didn't want to you know, cash out all your Ethereum right now. So you actually went to a decentralized system and, and got the, the capital needed to actually buy value in the real world. So um, that I think is the real exciting part of DeFi. And so uh, it, it's, it seems like, like your mainframe uh, system with the lending protocol is actually closer to that, where because it's fixed rate, it's almost like a, like a digital bond. Uh, 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 Absolutely. Sorts. And, and, and so, you know, what are the possibilities here? You know, uh, are we able to streamline the system? Um, you know, like you mentioned, the biggest problem with, with, with the DAO is, is that delay from, from, from an external price point to internal. But that seems to be the issue with blockchain. How are we able to con truly connect DeFi with the inputs of the real world? Because then it becomes much easier to do things like you did, you know, instead of like, in your issue, you want to buy a minivan. Um, and, and, and you took out that loan, but you still had to pay off that loan, you know, at the end of the day, you still needed that capital. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and so essentially at the end of the day, you end up with the same problem, actually even slightly bigger problem because you, you probably, uh, sold it for less than the loan were. So what was the added value in your case with the minivan? What did you gain by actually utilizing the system to take the loan? If you had to pay back the loan, you know, either selling that crypto you didn't mm -hmm. want to sell originally, you know, what was the gain there? Yeah, so, so this is what I like to say. And, and then I'm, I'm actually going to uh, uh, challenge kind of your assumption here uh, about what we, where we see DeFi going and how, how we see it uh, um, being utilized in the future. But, but, but first around, you know, some comments around that minivan experience. So what I'd say is basically like I printed a minivan out of thin air. So it started with $20,000 worth of Ethereum. And, and the benefit to me was that I got to maintain exposure to $20,000 worth of Ethereum. So $20,000 worth of Ethereum, I, I print uh, 10,000 DAI. I, I then take the DAI, I sell it for USDC. I go from Coinbase into my bank account, right? So then I, and then I go to an ATM, I pull out the cash and I went and bought it uh, you know, off of Craigslist. And so then those following three weeks where we saw the value of Ethereum explode by 70%, that is what I wanted to happen. Because I, I, I wanted to protect my exposure and essentially the thirty or the twenty thousand dollars worth of Ethereum became worth thirty thousand dollars. And then, you know, just like we talked earlier where we have like an increase in credit, what I did is I, I took out ten thousand dollars worth of Ethereum, sold it for die, and then paid off the paid off the vault. And and, and so it's essentially I, I, I began the month and ended the month with twenty thousand dollars worth of Ethereum, but I had a minivan that showed up. And so that, that was the magical part for my wife is she saw like, oh, hey, this DeFi thing, this is kind of cool. Mm -hmm. And, and but, but like, it was extremely risky. I, and I don't think, I, I, I actually do not believe like, like that this is going to be the mainstream use case. So like mainframe enables more predictable opportunities like this. But, but when you think about it, I mean, th there's so much privilege in having $20,000 worth of Ethereum to begin with. So, so as I look at, like, for example, my mom, she, she ain't got $20,000 worth of Ethereum, uh, nor would I really trust her with $20,000 worth of Ethereum. <laughs> so, so and, and in fact, if she did, she, she would be sending it to me to have me manage it, right? So, so th this sort of thing is, uh, and, and my mom is actually quite technical. Like, she runs a business. She has these embroidery machines. That, like, she, she uses computers all day. And, and so, like, th this is a... Uh, so, so this is not a diss on my mom, but really just like the, this is so niche that, mm -hmm. that I, what, what I think that's going to happen and is going to continue to happen is that the, the real use case for DeFi is to serve DeFi, right? Like uh, one of the criticisms I hear mm -hmm. uh, is, is that like, oh, it's just a bunch of rich, rich people, you know, passing around money and deciding what's cool you know, we pick a new emoji each week and then we, we pass it around and, and it, it's just a game against ourselves. It's, it's almost as though COVID has made us so bored that we can't sit around and uh, play poker anymore and then kind of pass the chips between us that we have to create these funny, uh, you know, uh, emoji, Ponzi-nomic uh, powered uh, games. It's just poker. We're just passing money around with a group of friends. But, but really, DeFi only serves people in DeFi. And, mm -hmm. and, and when I look at mainframe, what, what are going to be like the, the big use cases here? Honestly, the big use case is taking existing or early stage tokens that don't have 
any value today that's purely speculative and adding value to it. And so do, you know, so, so for example, I'm, I'm involved with several investment groups and, and these guys have, you know, tokens that either they're under contract not to sell or, or tokens that are, are just, uh, they, they haven't realized the, their full potential yet. And, and there's nothing they can do on them. Like there's nothing you can do with it. They just sit there, they have a value, but, but mm -hmm. as soon as, you know, so, so by partnering with certain entities, if you're like a big investment firm, man, you wanna be, you, you wanna be like uh, really buttering up, you know, mainframe and compound and Aave, or you better be buying lots of their tokens because you wanna control the governance that's going to list your bags as collateral mm -hmm. types, because all of a sudden, that becomes a productive asset as soon as it gets listed on Compound or Aave, and now you're earning comp. And so, mm -hmm. so you know, basic attention tokens, uh, most recent uh, uh, utility has been farming comp. And, and, mm -hmm. and, it, and it has a whole nother mission, and that's cool. But like, there's not much you can do with basic attention token outside of farming comp and then sitting on it. But why not sit on it and farm comp? Or why not sit on it, farm comp, and borrow against it to go play your sushi games, your poker Friday night, right? Mm -hmm. So so I think what, you know, so, so what, what is mainframe really going to do? Is It's going to unlock existing economic potential for token projects that are early stage that we either partner with or that we, you know, or that the people who hold MFT token vote to add with proper safety parameters so, so that they can realize new opportunity. So mm -hmm. we, we really are going to be serving DeFi. It, it, this, mm -hmm. this stuff is too hard to use for my mom to go and buy uh, you know, a, a car with. Now, sure, I could go buy a car with it. And I think it would be cool stories for us to share. It's one of my talking points. But in yeah. truth, in truth, this is just a, a little bit more sophisticated, nuanced tool that is going to help people farm uh, and like realize uh, potential value of their uh, bags that are sitting idly. And we transform mm -hmm. those idle bags into productive assets overnight mm -hmm. by voting them mm -hmm. in. And, and so I think that's why you, you look at cream.finance, you know, those guys, those guys are really pushing the envelope because overnight they can make your token desirable and, and, and be in a different way than like adding utility. And, and so mm. this, this, this whole house of cards is built on speculation. And, and mm. these are tools of speculators. And, and, and I, I hesitate to use the word gambling because I really think we, you know, so c compared to 2017, 2018, we have projects that do have utility. We, we have projects that have launched that, you know, basic attention token has an actual browser. You know, we, we, the, the, like people are actually, uh, you know, paying for people's attention. Uh, we, we have, uh, you know, futures markets. You know, Augur, I think, is a good example of utility. We, we, we've got, uh, and, and, and then we've got these lending protocols that, like, it's very hard to argue with, uh, you know, the billions of dollars in, in value that are being leveraged every day. And it's so people can have more sophisticated types of exposure to go after opportunities that they see that maybe others don't or that uh, others do see and they just want to make their assets more productive. Mm -hmm. Well, I, mean, I must say it's very refreshing uh, to hear someone uh, you know, speaking at, that's in the DeFi space, speaking as candidly about DeFi, I know as you are, you're just saying what it is instead of making these grand um, proclamations that, that, that I think uh, many people do um, unfortunately, um, in, in our industry. So I, once again, I, I tip my hat to you for that. Um, Thank you. So, I mean, I, 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 essentially, I, I, have we seen kind of the end of hodling where, where, where it's like, why would I hodl? Why would I sit there and hold my crypto if I could actually hold the crypto and make it work for me uh, by, by, by yield farming? That, that's, you're essentially taking things that would just sit there and do nothing because you believe in its future value and have it sit there and work for you because you believe in its future value and you also want it to create value right now. So, so let's take a look at mainframe's history. Anyone who goes to coin market cap and zooms out on the all time on our token, you know, we, we, we've got this pattern that I like to call this like the big water slides, right? Like it, it, it started high and it only went down, right? So, so what, what happened was we, we 
we're bad at predicting the future. And everyone who like actually invested in our token and our vision was equally as bad at predicting the future. This is a really hard thing to do. Predicting the future is not easy. You know, we, we make no apology for not being able to predict the future properly. I mean, who could have predicted what's happening today in 2020? Like this is insane, the reality that we're walking through, you know, that, that uh, you know, this virtual conference is happening. Uh, we're, we're not meeting in person anymore. Like predicting the future is a very difficult mm -hmm. task. Yet it's not something that, that we in crypto and, and the natural speculators that we are uh, shy away from. So, so we got it wrong. But what I think you're going to see is it's much like the gas tokens we see in, in Ethereum, where they're trying to smooth out the cost of transactions over time so that you purchase your gas token when demand is low, and then you spend it when demand is high, but the actual cost mm -hmm. to you kind of becomes uh, hopefully more constant. And, right. and anybody who's been participating in yield farming understands the utility of a gas token. But, but for like, to take our token, we got it wrong, right? And what, what it does is, I think this is the, the, next phase, the next phase of sophistication for hodling. And so you used to, you used to like, uh, you know, in, invest in these projects or purchase these tokens as, as a speculation that you believe in the team or the vision or whatever. And, and knowing that, that it's, we're really bad at predicting the future, what you can do now is, is if you saw something that was more shiny, you would have to sell it and then go, you know, I, I would sell my MFT bags to go after Polkadot. Or I would go, you know, sell, sell something because, oh, it looks like they're further along. Or uh, I like the headshots on their website of their team uh, better. They, they, they used a professional photographer and then, they, you know, these other guys, they just imported those, uh, those headshots from LinkedIn. Like, like the, the types of stuff that you have to judge a project on before mainnet is very limited. And a lot of it just comes down to like website design or team headshots or the history. But like uh, what, what, what we end up doing now is with these lending protocols is if there's sufficient liquidity in the market, then you can actually smooth out the demand curve where I don't have to sell my MFT bags to go and invest in Polkadot. I can maintain my exposure to MFT and I can go out and grab some polka dot. So mm -hmm. I, I think that th this is only going to amplify uh, the tool set with which we have to actually have strong hands. And, and hopefully we, we see less of uh, these, these huge you know, uh, sell-offs uh, that, that you know, there's a lot of finger pointing and blame game going on. You know, and, and, and we're kind of seeing one of the artifacts is that, is that we're doing these uh, now fair, uh, as we'd like to solicit them, launches of protocols. I, I, I think, you know, Cream, Cream that I was talking about earlier is attempting to do this. There's another one that's, you know, another fair launch of Compound because apparently theirs was so unfair or, you know, Uniswap, uh, you know, them, them giving it away for free was so unfair because we know in the future that they're going to do something nefarious. But I, mm. I, I think, you know, when, when I look at it, uh, these tools are going to help us uh, recognize that, uh, that there, there's probably uh, a lot more rational thought happening by each group of participants. Those early seeds of like those early angel investors into projects are acting rationally. The retail inv investors are acting more rational, more rationally than we give them credit for. And if we increase the tool set and make it a little bit more sophisticated for them, then what, what you'll actually end up doing is you'll, you'll get these uh, you know, protocol politicians leveraging for their bags to be added to these different protocols and uh, that allows them to maintain their exposure. I don't think everyone who sold MFT early on necessarily wanted to, but th they're looking at like, well, where's the market going? Oh, it's bleeding now. And it just perpetuates the issue. Well, that, now, now you, can, uh, you, you have a little bit more sophisticated tool here to, to help smooth out that demand curve and hopefully uh, be a better funding mechanism for projects. Mm -hmm. and, and speaking of, of projects, you know, a couple of months ago, Mainframe actually acquired uh, Savlier, which does kind of real-time payments, you know, for like an employee getting paid in, in real time, which is such a cool idea and such a, I love it, such a great, in my mind, a use case of a new technology to enable this kind of new, um, you know, this new innovation. Um, in the world, but uh, how are you guys integrating that into mainframe? How does that fit into this whole, this whole, you know, um, this whole product that you guys are, are, are selling? So, so th this is what I'll say. Today, uh, 
we, we have, we have, we, we follow a very structured thesis at mainframe. So, you know, we, we have a, uh, uh, kind of a, a, I don't know what, what would be the like politically correct way of saying that like, you know, people bought into us, really believed in us and were let down because it didn't work. And, and, and likely it is because we, we have a, a new group of unsophisticated investors that are able to experience both the up and downside of an investment. And they, you know, they're Twitter warriors. And, and so they don't understand that they were taking huge risk. And when they do take a huge risk, they want to whine about it or they want to like, uh, they want to point fingers at somebody. And, and those, those fingers are never coming back to them to acknowledge that, hey, maybe they also uh, were, were equally as bad at predicting the future. And, and so, so, so really here, what, what we end up having is um, the, these, these investors I just lost my train of thought. It was such a good thought. Uh, so, so we were talking about a Sabler and you were asking me about uh, how, okay, how it fits to, into, how fits into to the whole mainframe, you know, uh, 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 protocol product. Um, you know, what, what was the purchase? What, what was, what was the purpose of that acquisition? What, what did they, what did they give to you guys? Was it the, the technology, the team? Um, uh, what, what do you guys do now with, with Sabler? Yeah. So, okay. So, so, so the short answer, oh yeah, I remember what I was going into. So we, we, we've got these, uh, these unsophisticated investors that, that are kind of uh, not used to the losses. And so we, mm -hmm. we, co we come out and, uh, and, and we, with this colored past of ours where we, we haven't necessarily delivered value, MFT token has very limited utility outside of speculation today. And, 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 and so we, we have two priorities. We want to deliver a protocol that is uh, safe and we want to deliver it in the least amount of time as possible. And, and so we, we actually have, uh, every time we, we have a new feature that we want to add, we just say, hey, we're prioritizing for simplicity, wh which promotes security and speed to mainnet. And so, so in version zero, nothing. The, the short answer is Sa Sabler is not going to be a, a part of version zero. And, uh, but we continue to maintain the project because we have hopes that we're going to be able to integrate it as a part of, you know, either some token utility mechanisms or some governance mechanisms where we can have these, you know, time lock voting. Uh, there, there's some clever things you can do uh, with streaming tokens back to yourself, where you essentially mm -hmm. take certain tokens off of the market and, and put it in a certain place and then allow people to claim them in a linear rate. And so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we have projects that are using Sablier to manage their token uh, vesting schedule. And, uh, we're, 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 you know, we, we pay some of our employees with, uh, with Sablier and Stablecoin and stream it to them over the whole month. And they get to claim it when they want. Now, mm -hmm. whenever you have unpredictable gas prices, you know, how, how, how many times do you think people are claiming their paychecks? Once, you know, and so mm -hmm. yeah. it's somewhat of a charade here because yeah. we want to use it. And that's how you know, a lot of things start. But, uh, you know, what we saw in Sabir was something that, that uh, was being used, something that had some utility and, and a team behind it that w could really deliver. And, mm -hmm. and what we, we were rebuilding our team at the time. And so this made sense to go after, you know, I, I'm trying to build people's confidence in mainframe and our ability to execute. And I don't think there's a stronger way you can do that than to take someone who has built something useful that has a reputation in the community like Paul and, uh, and, and bring them and make them and put them in charge of your development. So, uh, so the short, in the short term, nothing, because we're focused on, on delivering as fast as we can and as safe as we can. Uh, and then uh, we're, we've got some interesting ideas that we're toying around with for the new tech, token economic model, which nothing has been published on and, and which, you know, is, uh, there, there's, I have nothing to say about it now, seeing as uh, mm -hmm. this, uh, that, that's not how I um, publish new information. I, I, I don't like information asymmetry. So it will be, you know, mm -hmm. official blog posts, you know, go through all the right channels. Uh, but mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm excited to see what, what happens with that. But uh, you did mention a, a crucial uh, a, a set of phrase in there that was very crucial where because of the gas prices, so people are going to, to pay once. And that's a big issue 
facing DeFi right now with Ethereum is just too congested. It cannot scale to support the, the, you know, the, the, the DeFi use cases that are being used today, which, which is, you know, it's not being asked even that much uh, and already it cannot handle um, all, all of this throughput. So the, the question is, you know, what is the solution in, in your view? What will be the solution? Will, will, will you know, Ethereum 2.0 ever come out? Uh, will, will it be a, a layer two solution? Uh, or, or will another, another protocol, you know, like maybe poke it out or will another protocol pop up and, and DeFi will say, all right, Ethereum, you served our purpose. Uh, you were great or you still are good for these use cases. But hey, if we really want to get serious here, yeah, we're going to have to, to turn to someone else. So th this is what I see. So, so um, in, in my recent AMA, you know, uh, you know, I had the question, what keeps me up at night? And honestly, gas prices was the thing that keeps me up. Gas prices threaten my protocol in a way that, that's quite unique. Uh, but but I, I, think that, I think that the market is disagreeing with your concern and my concern about gas prices. As I watch my own behavior participating in sushi, my own behavior in participating in these other farming things, I, I, I calculated the, the other day, I, I spent over $1,000 in gas fees you know, last week. And, and it, it's just like, I just don't care. Because, <laughs> because my capital is earning me something, you know, 60% APY. I, like, I earned that in a day, like, right? So, so you, you, you see my privilege kind of like oozing out right here. But, but this is the reality for most people in DeFi of material consequence. So there are yeah. people in DeFi that are not of material consequence. And those are people who don't have as much resource. And then you have people of material consequence, which have all the cash, right? And so DeFi, like other capitalistic type systems are going to reward those who have cash, those who have wealth already. Those are the people who are going to be able to acquire enough governance tokens to get their bags parked on, you know, supported being a part of these new, it, this is no different than what we see of uh, you know, protocols that are more heavily VC backed for some yeah. reason get listed on Coinbase sooner than other pro projects, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like, but it's no secret. They're friends. They, they, they've mm -hmm. made each other money in the past. You, you shouldn't expect anything different. And, and in my mind, the, the, my, my objective is always to learn the rules and play the game. And, and, and so, so, th so this is what's happening. You know, typically with these types of systems, there becomes, you know, a, a, a equality divide, uh, income inequality. And, and the reason why is because the majority of the rewards goes to those at the top or rather those with the most resource. And, and so I don't care about $1,000 in gas in a week because honestly, I just park my money in Yiffy and it makes me $1,000 a week. So mm -hmm. it's just like, uh, it, it's until I am losing money from gas fees and this mm -hmm. space is uh, able to convince me to not participate in the next mining frenzy, I'm going to keep doing it. And as long as my balance continues, you know, my stable coin balance continues to grow, th those gas prices ain't coming down. And I'm not going to any other chain because this is what I'm familiar with. Th I, this is the consumer behavior. And, and so, but, but this is what it does is it cuts the short, the, the, the small guy out. And so if, if you want to go and let's say that uh, you want to take out, like opening a vault on MakerDAO right now, extremely expensive. You're probably paying 50 to $100. When I did that for my minivan, I, I'm probably talking $5. Mm -hmm. so, so this is, it, it just means that the, the use cases that Ethereum can cater to shifts away from the gaming, the micro, microtransactions, things like Sablier, where you're streaming your money and it's like this mm -hmm. constant stream. Well, you've got to claim it and it's going to cost you $10 to claim it. Can you imagine? Mm. We all complain mm. about the bank charging us a $10 fee to, you know, cash our check. And then we turn around yeah. and we invent this system that costs me $10 to cash my check. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's somewhat ironic, but, but the value proposition is there and that's why it continues to exist. What I think is happening with these side chains, well, the most mm. interesting one is Binance Smart Chain. So Binance Smart Chain, they have all these resources. They have a sustainable mm. business model. Man, yeah. like if you want to talk about early utility, BNB was there, right? Yeah. Uh, so, and, 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 and so really what you have here is you have all this resource sitting over here looking very lucrative. 
And when I, as an opportunist over here, I've got some development skills and I, I don't, I, I shouldn't like uh, try and downplay the, the capabilities of the cream dot finance uh, um, engineering team. But, but really I see them as opportunists. Really, mm -hmm. they are farming Binance for their uh, yield. So Binance yeah. has all these incentives. They want to be, yeah. they want to, you know, uh, lure people over with these cheap fees. Well, yeah. okay, cool. So they launch on Binance. I bet you that they got a little bit of support from Binance. They're getting, and it might not be in cash. It might, but it might just be engineering support, but certainly there's a marketing, uh, uh, you know, when we talk about marketing, like I spend a lot of money on marketing and they're getting it for free, right? So because mm -hmm. they're rubbing up. And so, so if, I, if I were being an opportunist, I, I happen to be in a position of influence here, I might consider all of these solutions and just be like, I'll throw my stuff everywhere. It's just copy paste compounds code and I'll go, yeah. I'll beat compound to it. Like there's, there's I'll do this all day. Like, you know, there, yeah. there's, there's people that are going to pay you to come and be on uh, you know, polka dot or the side chain and because they have these reserves. And so if you're a good negotiator, all you're doing is yield farming. I mean, that's what this uh -huh. space is good at is extracting value and, and putting on a show like going to the parade and looking like, Oh, look at how much value sushi has is locked up. Look at how much value is now over on Tron or Binance. And, and the thing is we, we don't really know what the moats are. We, we, I mean, we're all discussing it. We're all looking at it. We created this super fluid, super liquid system where it cost me 10 bucks to move tons and tons of money that, that is instant. You know, I, I, you know, one of the uh, quality or one of the reasons I enjoyed using MakerDAO for my minivan loan was I didn't have to ask anyone's permission. They didn't have to look up any of my personal information. I just clicked on a computer at 11 o'clock at night and boom, I had the money and then, you know, the next day I just ran to an ATM and it was there. And um, okay. So, so maybe I'm skipping over the three to five business days that Coinbase took to get it into my <laughs> bank account. But, but, but if effectively I didn't have to interface with other human beings and as an engineer, oh man, give me that system <laughs> any day. Right. So, so yeah. I, I, I look at this and I, I just think side chains is kind of the, the the meta harvesting that is happening at the protocol level and you're going to see teams that are in need of resources chasing after the incentives that exist there you know tezos is doing a similar thing and and you're going to see lots of copycats and we see this in our in, in the own world you get a business in america that's succeeding you know what you're going to do if if uh, so, so for example i i have some some friends in in pakistan they, they, they see clones of American companies all the time because, uh, you know, the, the big money, the VC money is proven product market fit. So it's much lower risk to say, hey, maybe people want an app that they can hail a ride from. And mm -hmm. there's a way we can get around this taxi regulation. And then Uber mm -hmm. shows up and guess what they're going to do? They're going to acquire that company because it's cheaper mm -hmm. to acquire than to try and bootstrap it themselves as soon as they enter that market. So it's the mm -hmm. same thing here. I don't believe we're going to see a lot of, like, I don't think Compound is going to purchase Cream. If, mm -hmm. if anything, uh, Cream is going to front run Compound, extract some value, and then Compound may eventually show up and kind of sunset Cream because mm -hmm. they've got the reputation, they've got the trust. And, and, and honestly, if, if uh, they've got a lot of smart people trying to build on top of their protocol, with those smart people comes more exposure to uh, discovering vulnerabilities. And so if somebody's going to uh, disclose a vulnerability, I bet you Compound has the highest reward versus something like Cream. And, and, and mm -hmm. so you, you go and disclose it to Compound and you claim it, and then, and then uh, Compound is able to maintain the safest reputation. And it's not Compound's responsibility to go and hunt down Cream and the 47 other forks. And so, mm -hmm. In, in terms of like sizable money, you, you, you've got to have it, you've got to feel confident that the system you're parking your money in is not going to lose it in, in order to, to get that money to grow. And so that's why we see with like, you know, the likes of Compound using formal verification and the likes of Uniswap using formal verification and, and the teams that use these types of tools and build for you know, sustainability long-term and, and put that experiential knowledge inside their organization, 
those are the teams that are going to be able to avoid the, the large hacks, the large loss of money. But right now, no money has been lost. I mean, out, out, outside of uh, your, your BZX or whatever, like, mm -hmm. you know, but, but like anybody still parking their money there, they understand the risks. They, they, mm -hmm. They're there because probably there doesn't exist a sufficient alternative for them to do what they're wanting to do with their money. But I bet you if Cream took a look at BZX and figured out what they were doing, and, and built it without the spaghetti code that uh, th they would have some product market fit because there's a whole lot of money that keeps going back and, and, and keeps getting lost. Uh, you know, it might get returned, but, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this is, you know, the next phase is kind of the, the exploits and zero days that are gonna weed out the, the copycats um, mm. and these fair, fair distributions. Uh, you look at Sushi right now, they are struggling to get organized, yeah, you know, they they mm -hmm. had it all, and 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 Chef Nomi, man, yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's he's sold out probably because his privilege is he already mm -hmm. had it figured out, and this was just the yearly bonus, right? Uh -huh. And but but if Chef Nomi were someone like this was actually like if if uh, Zero X Maki were Chef Nomi, meaning like Zero X yeah. Maki is this figure that's a little bit younger doesn't have the, the position in real life of, you know, uh, you know, the same type of employ, employment that, uh, uh, chef, you know, the chef does. And, and so, like, he, if we had switched those roles, like, Xerox Maki would have come in and he would have been the central leadership that, that honestly runs a more efficient system. You look at, you look at uh, Bitcoin versus um, Ethereum. Ethereum has clear leadership. That's going to mm -hmm. allow them to be more nimble. That's going to allow them to, you know, really develop uh, along a path. And, and, and we're lying to ourselves if we think Bitcoin doesn't have clear leadership. We just don't want to talk about it because then it looks less decentralized. But when, when every single core developer is taking their paycheck from the same entity, it begs the question, who's in charge here? And, and so, but, but, but when you've got that clear leadership, you get certain efficiencies that you're able to move quickly for. And these community uh fair distribution tokens especially those who are anonymous they're they're going to struggle to get over certain total value locked uh metrics because vcs and 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 the the real rich you know the, the people mm. with real money they're not parking their money in your protocol now until they know who you are what your mm. intentions are and, and and make sure that you've got in, in line aligned incentives because they're not uh -huh. dumb you know, this, this isn't dumb money. These, we're all very clever in this space. Very rational, uh -huh. too. Uh -huh. Well, Doug, it's been really fascinating uh, getting to hear you speak on the subject. Unfortunately, we, we've run out of time. But I, once again, I just want to let you know, I, I've been interviewing a lot of people uh, for this DeFi conference as well as uh, other conferences. And I must say, I do tip my hat to you for, for speaking candidly uh, about this matter and, 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 and not pulling any punches, not, not to cause a reaction, but... but merely because it's the truth and, and that's what you believe and that's what you see. So, uh, Doug, thank you so much uh, for joining thank us you. today uh, and, and speaking your mind. And uh, for all of our viewers here at Reimagine 2020, I'm Yona Hockhauser. Thanks for watching.